with that, let us enter into our worship this morning. Let's get into our worship. And I failed to find out who was, op oh, Mike is going to be opening prayer. So we are going to begin our worship with prayer and call on Brother Mike to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Our God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. High above all names is your name. Jehovah God, Yahweh. We are grateful to be able to gather as your people. We are grateful to be called your children. We are grateful to be able to take, care, take this memorial this morning to remember the commitment that we made and the gift that Jesus Christ made and that you made through him. We just pray that as we worship this morning, our hearts will be attentive and, our, uh, and pure and that we might truly engage in fellowship with one another in praise and support and in honoring you. We praise these things through Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Before we take of the Lord's Supper, let's sing, And Can It Be? And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood. Died he for me, who caused his pain, for me who scorned his perfect love. Amazing love, how can it God would die for me. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? You left your Father throne above so free and infinite your grace emptied yourself of all but love and fled for Adam's helpless race amazing how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? me. Boldly I come before your throne to claim your mercy immense and free. No greater love will e'er be known for It found out me. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my God, would die for me? Amazing love, how can it be 
that you, my God, would die for me. If you would take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Normally we would say, well, what, what are you gonna, why are you looking at this particular verse? Why, why, why this chapter? It doesn't really deal with the Lord's Supper, but it does in a lot of ways. When you look through John chapter 10, this is where Jesus is talking about himself as a good shepherd. And a good shepherd is one that is actually cares for his, his sheep. And so many times we don't want to look at ourselves as sheep, that we're helpless. We need a leader. We need someone who will direct us. We need someone that will guide us. We need someone that will make sure that we're in the right pastures and that we're receiving the right amount of water and that we're cared for. And, and actually the most important piece is when the shepherd calls that we hear him. And Jesus talks about it, and he says, uh, starting with verse 3, To him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech he has just used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying. So in verse 7, so Jesus said again to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may be that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, he who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So as we look at that passage, and before us we have the emblems that represent to us the body of Jesus, and the blood of Jesus. Jesus gave himself for us. That was his whole purpose. The whole purpose that he came and, and lived on the earth and taught his disciples and taught us through his word, the whole purpose is right here. The sacrifice, the willingness to give himself for us because he knew that without that, we have had and have no hope. Without Jesus' body being offered, without his blood being shed, we're lost. And we hear the shepherd. And that's what Jesus wants us to do, is to hear the shepherd. And we as his children today are hearing the shepherd by doing the things that he has said it's told us to do. And this is the one thing that he said, I want you to do every first day of the week. Remember me. Shall we pray at this time? Our holy God, Father in heaven, we are just humbled to be able to come before you, the great I am, to thank you, Father, for the emblems that are before us, to thank you for the bread that represents the body which Jesus offered on that cross, knowing, Father, the, the suffering that he would endure for us, knowing, Father, that it was the only way that he could redeem mankind before you. We just ask, Father, that you would help us as we partake of these emblems, 
that we would do so in a manner that is pleasing to you, our God, our Father, our King, our Master. We just ask that you would help us to do this in an appropriate way, and that we would always strive to bring honor and glory before you. And through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Shall we pray once again? Our Lord God, Father in heaven, we just again come before you to thank you for the fruit of the vine which represents the blood of Jesus, knowing that the blood is what washes away our sins. The blood is what makes us whole and pure before you. We just ask, Father, that you would help us to live each day realizing the sacrifice and love that was shown towards mankind. Help us, Father, to always strive to do your will and to live after your, your precinct, the things that you have presented to us. We just thank you again for Jesus and for the blessings we have through him. And through his name we pray. Amen.
Let's sing How Great Thou Art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great 
Thou art. Well, we have been spending quite a number of Sundays going through the Sermon on the Mount. In fact, we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount on Sunday morning since October of last year. So we've spent a good number of weeks. Uh, hopefully by now, some of you are very familiar with what's going on. Maybe the thesis statement, uh, which we'll mention in just a moment. And I had some very specific reasons why I wanted to go through the Sermon on the Mount, as it does serve as a very good introductory uh, place to kind of get an idea of what kingdom righteousness or citizenship in God's kingdom, what it's supposed to look like. That's kind of the foundation of this. And this morning, we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the final uh, verses in which Jesus is going to provide a parable for us, one which some of you might know even better as a kid's song, this morning, we're going to talk about Jesus' parable concerning the wise man who built his house on the rock and a foolish man who built his house on the sand. Good morning. It's good to be here this morning, isn't it? Boy, I tell you what, uh, it's going to be weird next week not having this thing on my face. Uh, I, I have preached more sermons covering my face here than I have otherwise. Uh, it's kind of crazy when you think about that, right? Uh, but I just want to reiterate some of the things that Richard was saying earlier. Uh, it is a huge testament to this group right here and how much you love each other that um, we just didn't have a lot of some of the problems and things. You know, some of the groups out east that I've heard about, I've told you that before and various things, and uh, just really... I just want to say as well, I really appreciate the heart uh, of the folks here and uh, the willingness, the desire to say, you know what, loving each other is more than these other things. And uh, I just want to say uh, with Richard earlier, uh, for me, it's it's been wonderful. And I really appreciate that. I appreciate uh, especially how willing everybody is uh, to accommodate one another to be here for each other to lift up each other to encourage each other and how encouraging throughout all of this you have been to me uh, and to my family as well as uh, yeah we kind of got here we spent about three months here and then all of this started uh, and so it's been a crazy ride and it's nice to uh, see the ending here in sight and I'm looking forward uh, to seeing this, some of y'all here on Wednesday night as we uh, kind of throw the masks away for those of you who would like to do that and uh, belt out a few songs, right? Uh, I think it's it's going to be good. Looking forward to that. And uh, But we don't need to get too ahead of ourselves because we are here right now worshiping together, singing these songs together, partaking the Lord's Supper together, and now opening up the Word of God together. Um, we do have some who are visiting with us, and we're really glad that you are here this morning. And, and I hope that uh, with the time that you spend with us this morning, you're going to feel encouraged and that there will be a lot that we are able to gain together from the way that Jesus finishes the Sermon on the Mount. Now, as I said, this is the ending, so why don't we just do a very, very brief review of what's in the Sermon on the Mount um, you know, we'll just go section by section, and I'll limit it to 10 minutes per section, and then we'll start in on the sermon for this morning. Um, remember, it starts with those Beatitudes, those kind of backward statements, happy is the one who has this bad experience, but it's all about the kingdom of heaven. Remember, it's repeated the beginning, the ending. He says that our happiness or the blessedness or whatever is all about the kingdom of heaven, but that's just kind of a shock statement introduction uh, where he begins to talk about being the salt, being the light, um, and, and in that, Jesus, remember, says, I didn't come to abolish the law, but in order, I came to fulfill the law, all of that, before you get into his thesis statement. 
And hopefully by now you remember what the thesis statement is, those of you who have been doing this uh, since October. Remember, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you can by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. I would imagine if you didn't have masks on, some of y'all just worded that with me because you've got that in right now. It's been drilled in over and over and over. That is his thesis statement. The Sermon on the Mount is all about a juxtaposition between what the Pharisees are doing and what true kingdom righteousness is all about. And so we read everything then in light of that comparison. Therefore, chapter 5 begins with his te the teachings of the Pharisees compared to what the proper teaching of the law would be. You have heard that it was said, that is, the Pharisees will tell you this, but I say to you this. And so he's instructing on what the proper uh, understanding of the law is. Then he goes in saying, don't be like those Pharisees because they're just actors. They have a part. They have a role that they're playing in the synagogues and on the street corners. And they simply go out and, and they're, they're just actors or the word that's often used, hypocrites. So don't be like the way that they act. Don't uh, do your righteousness to be seen by others. Then he talks about their views of materialism, that they, they seek after wealth. They store up treasures on earth, and they wonder, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? All these things, <laughs> Jesus says, look, that's taken care of. You don't have to worry about those things. Instead, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Uh, and then he talked about how the Pharisees focus on judging. And he does that by saying to the listeners, do not judge lest you be judged. For in the manner that you judge, you will be judged. And by the measure you use, it will be used against you. And then he follows that up by saying, look, quit giving them the good stuff you're giving them. Quit giving them your praise. Quit giving them the chief seats and, and the respect and everything else that you give to them that they don't deserve. Quit casting your pearls before these swine. Quit giving what is holy to these dogs. Um, he then finishes up that, through that section with the golden rule. Whatever it is that you would have others do to you, do it to them also. And then uh, we talked about a couple weeks ago the two paths that are there before you. Uh, you have that broad path that leads to destruction. You have a narrow path that leads to life. And how do you end up on that broad path? Well, that's where you go straight into saying, beware of the false prophets. Don't follow those Pharisees because those Pharisees are going to take you straight into destruction. Instead, follow Jesus, that narrow path that leads to life. And that then brings us to chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. Jesus says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them, he will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. Now everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, and they beat against the house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority, not as their scribes. So here's the conclusion. This is it. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount right here. Since October, everything that we've been doing, it's been building up here to this moment. This is the conclusion, and he concludes with a parable, which is something that he does in almost every one of his five major discourses throughout Matthew's account of the gospel. Now, this parable here, it's easy enough for us to understand, right? This is a comparison of two different people, two builders. Uh, one looks for a rock to use as a foundation for his house. The other one just simply builds on the sand. And some of you, I don't know, you may or may not know this. There's actually a song that goes along with this. Now, it's not in our songbooks, and I don't have the music for it. 
Uh, so I'm really going to lean on some of you kids out there to uh, really belt this out so that you can help these older folks who don't know this song very well. Uh, they'll be able to sing it as well. We're going to sing this song, and this is a song that I'm going to uh, make Sean go red in the face just a little bit here. This is a song we used to sing nightly for, I don't know, six, seven years it seemed like. <laughs> Um, you know, it just, it was Sean's favorite. Anytime we're like, okay, Sean, which song do you want to sing tonight? Wise Man House is, uh, was the answer. Now, he, he doesn't say it that way anymore when he says it on a nightly basis, but no, I'm kidding. Um, but this is a song that, that is really well known by the kids, but I think it's really good for the adults. We're going to sing this song, by the way, so go ahead and get your little builders out. Um, and if you don't know this, please don't don't feel burdened here or whatever. You, you don't have to sing along or whatever. Um, you know, a lot of this is uh, for the kids as well, but I think the adults can get something from it. We are skipping the third verse, by the way, just so you know. We're not going to do the third verse, um, you know, the one that really isn't biblically relevant to the parable in the context here um, at all. So we'll do the first couple verses here. Richard, would you mind running the slides while I'm doing the building? because uh, I'll mess it up otherwise. All right, the wise man house. Skipping the third verse, right? All right. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the wise man's house stood firm. But the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. Oh, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the foolish man's house went splat. That's a great song, isn't it? And it goes right along with exactly what Jesus is talking about right here. So putting aside the uh, song here and looking at it, what, what does this parable mean? Well, keep in mind, we're just following right along with what Jesus has been doing, where he's been providing two choices, right? From the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, it's the scribes and the Pharisees and Jesus, and it becomes particularly clear when he says you've got two paths to take. Now, remember, when he says that you have two choices, it really doesn't mean that you have two equitable choices, that you can do one or do the other, and it really doesn't matter. Uh, there really is no real choice. He says you can either build your house on the rock or you can build your house on the sand. And by the way, the whole point of Jesus saying this is that building your house on the sand is a terrible option. <laughs> you do not want to do that. Choosing the correct one boils down completely to listening to what Jesus says and doing what he says. And again, this is obvious, right? Do I need Richard, to, our uh, resident architect here, does Richard, does he need to come up here and explain why you want a good foundation for your house? Uh, does, does he need to explain why a rock is better than the sand? I mean, Richard, if, what would happen if somebody actually built their house on sand itself? Have you ever driven, or driven, have you ever written, uh, written up, drew up blueprints where someone said they wanted it on the sand? No, I'm glad, because if you had, you would have totally ruined my illustration here. Uh, but yeah, you don't do that. That's just dumb. <laughs> we all understand that. We all know that. And that's Jesus' point. You don't build a house without a firm foundation. 
Notice Jesus doesn't say anything here about the house itself. There's no comparison of the quality of the house. There's nothing about the craftsmanship, the designs. The entire comparison is about the foundation. Um, in fact, I think through this parable, let's just assume these are identical houses. Let's assume they're built by identical standards, built by identical or by the same company. And let's assume that the two storms are the exact same storm. Everything is exactly the same. The only difference is what is underneath the house. That is what the foundation is. When the storm comes, the foundation makes all the difference. One stands firm and one goes splat. So this is one of those uh, rare parables in which Jesus not only tells the parable, but he gives the explanation with it. In fact, he gives the explanation without anyone even having to ask for it. He says that the, the one who builds on the rock is the one who hears what he has to say. That is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, and then the rest of it, but, but that's what he's in reference here. The one who hears and then obeys, and the foolish one, the one who builds on the sand, is one who hears the words of Jesus but does not obey them. Again, this is pretty simple. Jesus is not concluding the Sermon on the Mount by uh, going deep into the theological pool of understanding. Um, he's being very simplistic. He's keeping it rather shallow, and yet there does seem to be some kind of depth here, which is the way it usually is. Now, in this final moment of this lesson, and Jesus is introducing a loaded concept. And he just kind of drops it there and then lets it marinate in the minds of those who are hearing it. And that's the comparison of the wise versus the foolish. Um, he actually rarely does this. In fact, I think in Matthew, there's only one other time that you're going to see a comparison explicitly of the wise and foolish. And I believe, and some of you all might correct me afterwards and uh, that'd be great, but I think you see this uh, with the comparison of the ten virgins uh, in the parable and uh, really his last sermon that's recorded for us. So what's the significance then of this idea of the wise and the foolish? Well, these are words, terms that come from wisdom literature and the Old Testament. It's a huge, important part of it. And it's more than simply someone being smart or someone being not smart. There are all kinds of smart people, brilliant people, even wise people. They're wise in various ways, but they're not the people that Jesus is talking about. And there are a lot of foolish people, extremely foolish people in various ways. Um, you know, you can find them all over the place but they're not necessarily what Jesus is talking about. We haven't spent any time studying Proverbs yet. We'll get to it eventually. It's, uh, it's on the docket at some point, right? Uh, through the years, we'll, we'll talk about that wisdom literature. And when we do, you're going to notice this comparison that's often made between the wise and the foolish. In fact, the Proverbs are mostly going to boil down to a comparison that's being made. This is good, this is bad. They're very simplistic, uh, they're caricatures, that's the way that they are. And the wise and the fool is kind of like the overarching one. And under that you have the righteous and wicked, the diligent, the lazy, the humble, the proud. These are ways in which wisdom and folly are contrasted throughout the Proverbs. Now, when we do finally get around to studying Proverbs and or Ecclesiastes or um, whichever one, you know, there's a little bit of contrast between that and, say, the Psalms, Job, and Song of Solomon, uh, which are written a little bit differently. Here's what we're going to learn about wisdom. I think the best definition that I've heard for wisdom, one of my professors once said, wisdom is skill in the art of godly living. Wisdom is skill in the art of godly living. 
you know, again, it's not just wisdom in general. It's not knowing how to do something. It's not having all the answers. It's knowing how to do something according to the will of God. That's what biblical wisdom is. It's not having all the answers in general. It's having the answers that are going to promote godly living. Living according to the will of God is an art form. It's not something that you just naturally do. It takes skill, diligence, training, practice, time. That's why the men who are regarded the wise ones in Israelite society were called elders because they were older. <laughs> they were the ones who sat at the gate and they dispensed the wisdom that they had received through the years. Now, they didn't necessarily have to be as old as Mike or Dale, um, I'm not suggesting that's the case, uh, but they did have to have lived at least some life in, in order to be able to dispense the wisdom that they had earned uh, and all that they had learned through the years. It's no mistake that this is one of the words that's used for shepherds within a congregation, an office that, that should be filled by those who are older, wiser, skilled in the art of of godly living. So how does one get to the point where they are skilled in the art of godly living? Well, the writer of Proverbs, probably I think Solomon, uh, in the, at least the first nine chapters, here's what he has to say. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge in 1-7, or the fear of the Lord's beginning of wisdom in 9-10. This is how you get there. It begins with a fear of the Lord. And yes, when it starts, <laughs> the fear of the Lord is an abject terror of God. It is a healthy terror. And I'm not sure exactly where it begins. Somewhere, someone uh, along the way said that fear is a terrible motivator, and, and that's kind of stuck. You know, people have this impression that fear is a bad motivator. It's really not true. Fear is a fantastic motivator. Fear of losing one's job gets him to work on time. Fear of hurting one's spouse causes him to remember birthdays and anniversaries. Fear of shame causes a person to make sure that he always has a picture of his family so that he's not going to be judged by those good parents who do always have pictures of their families. You know, it's that fear that drives an individual. And in every one of those instances, could love also be a motivator? Absolutely. Of course it could. It should be. I'm not saying that fear is the only motivator, uh, but fear is a good one, especially one that pushes in the very beginning. See, the fear of the Lord is not simply reverential awe or respect. You find this very clearly. Exodus chapter 19, God appeared before the people at the mountain, and the mountain quaked. The fire billowed, uh, the smoke billowed up into the sky. There was lightning and thunder and the sound of the trumpet that blared. And they weren't allowed to go up within a certain distance of the mountain or else they would be killed. And then God boomed his voice in such a way as he gave the Ten, ten Commandments that the people said to Moses in, in chapter, uh, chapter 20, 18 through 20, it says that they were terrified. And, and, you know, and they told Moses, look, you go and do this. And Moses tells them in that passage, look, you don't need to be afraid right now. But <laughs> he's showing you, and I'm paraphrasing here, he, the, the whole point is he's showing you who he is so that you will be motivated to never get on his bad side. That, in essence, is what Exodus 19 and 20 is all about. Fear is the motivator. Now, obligatory caveat, yes, John tells us, 1 John chapter 4, perfect love casts out fear. Eventually, we get there. Uh, I'm not suggesting that perfect love or, or that you maintain the same kind of abject terror Eventually, we get to the point where love is the prime motivator. Um, that's what the Bible says. But I hold to the fact that fear is also a proper motivator because that's also what the Bible says. It is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of the path that leads to life. 
the path that goes uh, into the law of God, that follows the law of God. It's the beginning of the path that causes one to turn to God and, and learn what it means to live according to the law. It's the path that learns what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. It's the beginning of the path to get to the point where you understand what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. It's the beginning of the path that sees through the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees, and it understands what it means when Jesus says you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It's the beginning of the path that rejects the, the, the false prophets who do nothing but act for the people and then judge them. It's the beginning of the path that leads to life. It's the beginning of the path that knows what kind of foundation to build your house on, and it's not the sand that the scribes and the Pharisees are trying to peddle. When the storm comes, this house, built on wisdom, stands firm. That being the case, what is then folly? We'll just take everything that I just said and do the opposite. <laughs> uh, that's the idea of the foolish man. Folly is the way that leads to death leads to destruction. Simply put, it's the scribes and Pharisees and everyone else who follows them, who cast their pearls before them, who give to them what is holy. It's all of those who follow them down the path that leads to destruction. These are the ones who build a, a, a carefully uh, planned house, great-looking house. They plan it all out. They, they get the materials. They go through the work and the construction, and yet they don't care where they build it. They go to the shore, pick up a handful of sand, and say, yeah, that looks like it should work fine. And what happens when the storm comes? That's what happens. So that's the foolish and the wise discussion. And Jesus says kind of nonchalantly, he just kind of drops this whole wisdom lit bomb on the listeners, and then he walks away. Because you can rest assured that when he mentions the wise and the foolish, everybody there understands his point. Now, when he talks about this whole comparison of the storm, it helps for us to kind of get a good idea of what exactly the storm is. And I've read uh, those who have suggested that the storm is the trials of life, that when you, know, you have a bad foundation, when things happen in your life, you, just, you won't be able to stand firm um, and this has some merit, as you know, the Word of God can obviously help us through all the trials that we face. That's the whole point, right? Uh, Philippians chapter four, uh, you know, starting verse six, um, where he says, "Do not be anxious," right? Um, you know, and then by everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your uh, requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You know, God, having a relationship with God, trusting him, relying on him, yeah, that gives you a peace. It gets you through these ordeals. And even if you read the bulletin article for today, uh, you know, the author there also um, kind of alludes to the fact that, yeah, this is helpful in the everyday trials that you go through. Sometimes that's the case. But I also know, and this may not be popular opinion, but have you ever noticed that people without the message of the gospel of salvation also get through trials in their lives? Uh, they may not have the exact same peace, but they get through them. Sometimes Christians face trials in such a way that it takes them over the edge. It's not always a guarantee that life is going to be rosy for someone who simply becomes a Christian. But there is a guarantee that is important to remember. That is getting through God's judgment. You see, the storm has always come at times of judgment throughout the Bible. Um, at least in the way that I understand how Genesis 3 should be translated, God comes in judgment in the storm when he comes to Adam and Eve from the very beginning. Uh, the ending of Job God comes in the storm. Even the Mount of Transfiguration, God comes in the storm, and it's Jesus who has to, who has to intercede between them. 
God shows up in the storm. The prophets often talk about it. In fact, the picture that Jesus uses often to talk about the return of um, Jesus at some point, he talks about the Son of Man coming on what? The clouds. Uh, this is, again, the sign of judgment in the storm. Many of Jesus' statements concern judgment against Jerusalem by the Romans in these kinds of ways. Even then, there's always that double look at what we would call final judgment that's under discussion even in those sections where Jesus is talking about coming in judgment against Jerusalem. And when you look in the context here, starting in chapter 7, verse 13, doesn't it really give this sense of final judgment? There are two paths, one that's broad, one that's narrow, one leads to destruction, one leads to life. Starting from there through the rest of it, it seems as if this is the storm that's coming. And when he talks about the storm, notice how this is a complete storm. The rains beat it from above, the floods come up from underneath, and the winds bash it against the side. In other words, it's being bombarded from every way possible, up, down, sideways, doesn't matter, it's getting hit. This is a complete storm destruction there's no escape there's no respite it's complete and full both houses can be identical in this story and it's not like one is better built than the other same material same design same everything except for one thing the foundation that's the only thing that's different the foundation everything else is the same a person can build a nice looking house by following the scribes and the pharisees but he can't build a house that's going to withstand judgment because the foundation is sand. Someone who builds a house following Jesus and his teaching, he will face judgment, but he will not fall in that judgment. He will stand firm. He will survive it because he has built his house on the rock, a solid foundation. And I'm not sure it's necessary, um, to come up with statements about the church being built on the foundation of Jesus and the apostles, or when Jesus tells Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. Uh, I think those are just common sense things, like what he's saying here. I don't think you have to understand those in lieu of what he says in Matthew chapter 7. Jesus doesn't need to tell this parable so that other people can understand that a foundation is a firm thing. But I also don't have a problem with anyone who does make those comparisons the important thing is this jesus teaching is different from the scribes and the pharisees jesus life is different from the scribes and the pharisees jesus words are different from the scribes and the pharisees and everyone knew it when you look at the last two verses 28 and 29 you know, Jesus stopped talking. I bet when he stopped talking, you probably could have heard a pin drop. This message is not very long. Um, it, I mean, you might think so because we've been talking about it since October. Uh, but in reality, you can read through this very, very quickly. Um, I don't know if we have everything that Jesus said in this message. We have what Matthew wants us to have and what we need to have. But even in this short time, Jesus teaches in a way that the folks, they're not used to. They haven't heard before. Usually, the scribes and the, the Pharisees, they teach based on what the rabbis of old have said. Their authority comes because of what rabbi so-and-so or rabbi someone or other has said before. I mean, it actually makes a lot of sense. It's the same thing that I do, right? I hold no authority. The only authority that I have comes from what Peter has said or what Paul has said or what Jesus has said. All I can do is go back to this and say, these are the words that hold authority, not my own words. I'm just going to absorb them and regurgitate them back to you and try to help everyone to understand them better, right? But it's not based on anything that I say. I have no authority. I don't want that kind of authority. Um, this is the only thing that matters, the words of God. That's all the rabbis were doing. They just simply taught the other rabbis. The problem, though, is that they treated those other rabbis as if they held some kind of inspired authority. 
But what about Jesus' message? There's very little of the Old Testament necessarily here. Um, there is some, absolutely. But there's not a single rabbi quotation, unless you count the places where he said the rabbis messed this up. <laughs> Jesus teaches with authority. But it wasn't authority based on what so-and-so had said. He spoke as if the authority came inherently within himself. This was different. This was unique. This was weird. And this was perhaps refreshing. They are amazed by Jesus' teaching because he spoke as one having authority and not their scribes. But even so, this is the question. Now that these people have heard and they're amazed, what are they going to do about it? Remember, the wise man is not just the one who hears the words of Jesus. He's the one who does them as well. This may be what's in James's mind as he's thinking about, or when he's talking about being doers of the word and not merely hearers only. Not like someone who looks in a mirror and then walks away and forget what it was that he looked like. Not someone who makes absolutely no changes at all. The wise man is one who not only hears, but then he does it. He lives according to the true teaching. He performs act of righteousness without acting or, or putting on a show or a play. He doesn't worry about money or material things. Instead, he trusts God and he puts his treasures up in heaven. He doesn't judge others, but he leaves the judgment up to God. Instead, he treats others in the way that he would want them to treat him. Those who do not follow the false teachers are the ones who are following Jesus. They're not just hearers, they are doers. Jesus is asking here for a lifetime commitment to change. Change for the sake of God. You know, I bet there was more than one or two people who walked away from this and thought, well, that was really nice. I really enjoyed listening to that nice young man. There were probably a few people who did that. Um, I bet there were plenty of people who heard far fewer who actually were changed at all. Why do I think that? Well, because that's the way it's been through millennia, hasn't it? How many times do you think the Sermon on the Mount has been read or taught? Countless times around the world throughout history. And when it is, how often do you think it actually has a profound change on the ones who hear it? I would guess that number's a lot smaller. And yet, even so, as we are here concluding our study of the Sermon on the Mount, let me suggest to you it does not matter to you or to me what others have done with this, does it? They're not building my house or your house. The question becomes, what are we going to do with the Sermon on the Mount? We've just finished it. We, we took a long time to go through it. Now that we've finished it, are we finished with it? I mean, we've heard the words. Is that enough? Because, folks, if we are hearers only, then as much as we'd hate for it to be the case, what we do is we join the ranks of the foolish ones. And those are not the ones that we want to be a part of. Because what happens in the end is our house goes splat. Let us all be hearers and doers of the word. Then we'll be like that wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rains fall, and when the floods rise, when the wind blows, when that day of judgment comes, we will stand firm, and we will live eternally with our Father in heaven. Let's bow together. Our great and glorious God, we come to you thanking you for for every good and perfect gift that we have. But most importantly, this morning, we thank you that you have given to us what we need to make a wise choice to build on that foundation provided by your Son. Help us to live with uh, true biblical wisdom to shine your lights in this world. We thank you for Jesus, for the hope that we have through him. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we are all building a house. I mean, it's, you, you can't avoid it. 
your house is being built. The day of judgment is going to come. You can't just say, well, I don't want it to be the case. The question is, what foundation are you building upon? That's what we each need to ask ourselves. Are you ready to build your foundation on the rock, the words of Jesus Christ? Are you ready not only to hear them, but to do them? Are you ready to give yourself over to him? Uh, we're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. As we sing this song, if you are ready to be baptized into the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, uh, we simply invite you to come up to the front, have a seat, and we'll assist you. If we can help you in any way as we're singing the song, come forward as we sing this song for your invitation. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow, no turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, I'll follow him. Me at this time as we're dismissed with prayer. Our blessed and holy Father in heaven, we are so grateful that we have had another opportunity to assemble together with the saints to be able to hear your word preached to us once again and to be able to raise our voices in song and in prayer. We're thankful for all that you do for us throughout the day and we pray that you will continue with us as we try to make the choices that are best for us and we pray that that choice that we make will be Jesus, and that he will be the cornerstone of the foundation that we build on his word. We pray then that you will uh, help us as we navigate through this week and uh, keep our minds focused on those things that will uh, increase our hope of reaching our heavenly home. In Christ's name we pray, amen.